Thank you so much, guys. Uh, welcome to round two, w uh, Netherlands WSDC 2022. This is really my honor to chair this round. Uh, my name is Daisy and no uh, gender preferences, she, her. So um, we really have an honored board of panel of judges. So please judges and um, introduce yourselves as you appear in, a, in the sequence of the tab. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Kyle, no preference. Best of luck to both teams. Thank you very much, Kyle. G'day everyone, um, my name's Sam. Good luck for this round. Thank you, Sam. Would trainees introduce themselves? If you have gender pronoun preferences, please do declare so. Thank you so much. Uh, Amal does not appear to be here. Uh, I'm Joseph, uh, good luck to everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm always not here. Okay, uh, we'll be moving on. Thank you so much. And um, what about the debaters from the proposition team? And um, this would also serve as a very quick mic check as well. Hi, speaking first is Rohan. I prefer he, him pronouns. Speaking second is Karthik. I have no pronoun preference. Speaking third is Yvisha. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Thank you so much. Opposition team? Hi, I'm Livia. I'll be speaking first. Pronouns she and POIs in the chat, please. Hi, my name is Tom Nunn Rutledge. Pronouns he, him, POIs in the chat as well. Hi, my name is Toby Mock. Uh, pronouns he, him, um, POIs in the chat, please. Thank you so much. Um, before your speech, please kindly indicate your POI preferences in case we forget. Okay, thank you so much. But even if POIs are allowed, please do not badge the debaters. Okay, and um, please leave the chat box only for timing and also POI function as well. I'm going to indicate time at one, seven and eight as well, but sometimes I may have some kind of time lag, but just serve as kind of indication of rough, uh, of rough indication of time. Okay. We are debating under the motion, this house prefers a world where instead of charging tuition fees to students up, up front, universities collect a portion of the income of each of their graduates upon graduation. Okay, without much ado, Prime Minister. Hey, just checking to see if I'm both audible and visible again. Yes, loud and clear. Amazing, cool. Mm -hmm. Speaker for a middle class family in Kenya, university is not an investment, it is a dream where they are forced into a choice to either not get educated or be crappled or be saddled with crippling debt. On our side, we make it an investment because you are no longer a financial burden to your family when you go to university, because you are an investment to university who are finally forced to care about you and because families finally have a shot at social mobility. On proposition, for the first time, we make university accessible to the people who need it the most. What's our stance in this debate? As a university graduate, you paid back your student fee proportional to your income. That's to say, for the next predetermined set of years, as built into a contract between you and your university, you pay 1% royalty on all your future earnings to your university in that set time period. Obviously, we support the continuation of public funding to university. The way in which this works is governments give public guarantee loans to cover the startup costs of this policy, such that in the long run, you are securitized and you are stable and you have a cushion. On comparative, the world that Australia needs to defend is the terrible status quo, when you are forced into high startup and front costs, where students have to pay for tuition, where they have to pay for expensive housing, and where they are forced to pay for food that they cannot afford on university campuses. Bearing that in mind, two arguments from Team India. First, on why we uniquely make universities more accessible, and second, on why we are great for the quality of education within universities and future careers of grads. On the first argument, what is the problem right now? University today's speaker has massive upfront costs. You are met with insanely high tuition fees, massive payments to dorms, and really, really expensive food and cafeterias. The reason this is true is because universities right now want to maximize their profits. That is because at the point at which they can do that, deans can maximize their salaries, administration can maximize their salaries. That gives them additional money to quote unquote beautify their campuses. We think this is terrible because it forces people into three terrible choices. First, 
This is beautifully massive financial burden, which means you don't go to university. This is terrible because in a society which places an emphasis on university and glorifies it, we think that this is when you are stalked at when you apply for a job. This is when you are told to go and flip burgers. Instead, this is when no one takes you seriously. We account for that. Second, we think that universities as they are right now, especially in parts of the world that aren't Australia, especially in parts of the world that aren't the US, are terrible for women, terribly inaccessible because families don't think that they should spend so much money on their daughter's university and they want to spend it all on their son instead. But the reason this is true is not because we don't recognize the importance of university, it's because of the high startup cost. We think that it being free for that daughter to go to school is the tipping point for when you start actually sending your daughter to university in the first place. We think that this is massively important in terms of giving women access to an education, which in the long run gives them access to financial stability, the freedom to do things like have their own bank accounts and leave abusive relationships. But second, we think that our policy is also uniquely good for the most marginalized stakeholder in this debate in terms of actors like women. Because after your daughter graduates, on our side of the house, uniquely you have to let her work. Why? Because that's the point at which she can pay back her contract to this university. What that means is that women on our side of the house are incentivized to get work experience, are allowed to go to jobs, are allowed to engage in the workplace, which means one, they have a far larger level of freedom than they do on comparative and on our side of the house, uniquely have access to a large network and support system. But the third choice, which is also crippling is people have to take on student loan debt in order to get access to universities. This is terrible because the way in which interest rates work is they pile up and they compound. What that means is that at the end of your life, you are forced into a debt which you cannot pay back. But second, the reason student loans specifically are so bad is because they are punitive in nature. For a middle class student at the point at which you can't pay a loan back, that's when your parent who co-signed on your loan's house is seized. That's the point at which your credit score tanks, which means you are screwed in the future because you no longer get access to loans to do things like start a business, to do things like buy a home and own property, which give you stability. We think that that is actively debilitating to the most vulnerable individuals in society. On comparative, why are we far better? First, there are no upfront costs. That's the point at which your parents are more comfortable doing things like sending you to university. Plus, you are more comfortable going to university. You don't feel guilty because you don't feel like a financial burden. You know that at one point in your life, you will pay it back. But second, crucially, only on side proposition do universities start doing outreach. You go towards things like poor and marginalized communities, so you can find brilliant kids within them. You find poor kids from marginalized communities and you build them up, because if and when they're wildly successful, you have massive rates of profit off of that. On their side of the house, universities don't even look at the favelas of Brazil, because they can only dent their coffins. There is no benefit to them from that. Before I move on to my second argument, there are two possible things I'll we'll say to this. First, they can't fix inaccessibility with scholarships. The first reason is because schools just don't oh, give them on a very large scale because it is money outflows. That is to say, it is free money you are giving away. There's nothing that you are gaining back from it. We think that that's really, really hard to pitch to your board of directors. Second, only the richest universities can actually afford to give out scholarships. These are the oh, hardest universities of the world. They're not universities that middle class people go to. But second, According to what they tell you, we think that universities actually take more kids on our side of the house because we think that even if you have one success, you make massive amounts of money. That's why you try and be as accessible as possible because that increases your probability of a massive payoff. Even one or two of the what most successful people for your university can be used to cross subsidize for the rest of your class. That's why universities are uniquely way more accessible on Gov. Before I move on, yeah, Australia. Uh, while the upfront value of uni fees is far more concrete, portions of earnings are far more speculative. In this case, how can you say that universities won't, uh, uh, won't, won't confidently balance their books without overcharging in their degrees? The first thing to note is that you can't overcharge for your degrees at the point at which there's no fee whatsoever. That is to say, on our side of the house, we are, in, we are more accessible at the point at which we uniquely don't have fees. I don't see where you were going with that POI. You miss our case, adapt to it at LO. On the second argument, why are we great for students' quality of education and careers? First, universities have incentives to ensure the long-term success. That is to say, I as a university can only pay my dean, can only beautify my campuses if I get paid back well by my students. 
that's the point at which I have an incentive to do things like build strong alumni networks so that my graduates can get good jobs and therefore pay me back. On comparative, the reason you are unlikely to do this is because it is very, very expensive to maintain and coordinate things like alumni meetings. Very, very hard to do things like build reunions. And the reason that's true is because you don't profit from it. On our side of the house, arts is the tipping point of doing things like building strong alumni networks, which are both important in terms of ensuring long-term career success, but also in terms of creating a cohesive university environment where people are happy because they can do things like learn from the mistakes of their predecessors when they can share stories. Second, we push a massive incentive for universities to care about you over the long term. That means that they're more likely giving you career guidance. They're more likely to help you work on your resume. They're more likely to polish you before you apply to job interviews, because that's the point at which they get paid back. On comparative, they think this is a relationship that lasts for four years. That's when the obligation is finished. But lastly, we think that despite anything they tell you on the possible quality of this education, at the point at which more people are actually getting access to university and therefore finally have chances at social mobility, we will always take it over Australia in this debate for all of those reasons proposed. Okay. Um... Are uh, judges ready to move on? Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, Prime Minister, for a very fine speech. Now we'll be moving on toward the leader of opposition. Here, here. Thank you. Um, as a reminder, I'd like my POIs in the chat, please. And assuming that I'm audible, I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. To put it simply, Team India does not understand what kind of debate this is. Because when the motion says you have to analyse what kind of world you prefer, they do not get to say that they suddenly increase the amount of government funding going to universities. This debate has to be a comparison between the status quo, where students cover the cost of universities by taking out loans which are paid back incrementally over the course of their working lives, over the idea that they're being charged upfront upon graduation by some kind of rate of their income, Team India could not assert that they got any more support on their side than we get on our side. One question in setup, what do we support? As I outlined in my introduction, we support the status quo where students pay their fees up front to the university and the vast majority of students fund this through some sort of student loan scheme. Noting particularly that in most countries or in many countries, there exists some government funded scheme to do this where there is no interest, unlike the punitive interest rates the Team India wanted to claim they existed, um, uh, like under our side in the status quo. So onto my first point of substantive as to why this policy will far worsen the operation of universities. It's important to analyze what tuition fees actually pay for in either world. They largely pay for the salaries of academics and administrative staff. Broadly, labor is the largest cost of any business. We think this is still true for tertiary education. The second thing that they largely pay for is any existing loans which the university has taken out. That might look like loans they had to take out to construct buildings and facilities or mortgages and rent that they have to pay on the land that they use for their campus. Note that in both of these cases, they are pre-existing costs. That means that they have signed contracts that they will pay back this money. They have made commitments that they will pay it back. That was incredibly important for the analysis as to how they then change their fee structure. Because note that they cannot escape the costs which they have committed to. They must commit to being able like, to these loans in order for them to operate, to have staff to teach their classes, to have classrooms to teach those classes in. So the specific change here is that in the status quo, students pay for their, the service they receive from universities before they receive that service, whereas now they pay upon graduation, meaning they have already received the three or four years of university education before they have to pay for any of that. That means that when universities charge students at, in the current year, they have to estimate the costs they are going to have over the coming years and the potential increase in what those costs might be in order to be able to continue to fund their institution. Now I'm going to outline why the estimate of what those costs might be is always going to be far higher than whatever they charge in the status quo. Note how this is directly responsive to all the analysis we hear from Team India about stakeholders like the middle class in Kenya and the women who can now afford university. We think it's actually going to be far less affordable because whatever the rates the universities charge will be trying to create a greater amount of money incoming to them. That means that the vast majority of people will be paying more than they do under the status quo. Why was that? 
Firstly, because as I already kind of alluded to, this is a far higher risk for these universities to take on, because unlike when they've already paid the cost and they can already look at exactly how much they need to charge, they have to include preparation for any future costs in the estimate of what they have to charge. We also think that it's likely that they're going to be incredibly cautious when making these estimates because being slightly overcautious means charging slightly too much. That's not really a harm for the universities. Being undercautious means defaulting on their loans, means they're never going to have another loan, means being unable to operate. That was a far, far too large a risk for them ever not to be super overcautious. And within this, they had to estimate things like inflation increases, like the increase in the cost for them to produce their service, like the interest rate rises on the loans that they've already taken out, like the wage growth rises of their staff that might occur due to market shifts or a change in union action. All of these economic factors increase the cost of these universities substantially. Look at around the world where inflation forecasts are reaching rates of 8, 9, 10% per year. Unis have to be able to pay the salaries of their staff. That means they have to overestimate what that inflation might do to wage growth. They have to overestimate what it might do to their costs. That meant they had to charge a really high proportion of graduate salary income so that they could collect a large amount of money to cover all these costs. On the whole, that meant that university, for the vast majority of people paying what we can assume would be like quite a high rate out of their income. This would be a massive expense to push on them. Notice in the response to the POI we gave, where we alluded to this, their only response was that, oh, well, the government is going to subsidize it. Obviously, that doesn't stand in a debate where they don't have any power to change the way the world operates and change the way government funding operates. That meant you cannot credit that response. And at the moment, it stands that university fees are going to be far more expensive. Before I move on to why courses are worse, um, I'll take a POI if there is one. Yeah, if you get our model in this round wrong, you are not charged a set fee after university. Rather, you just have to pay back a proportion or a percentage of your earnings for a specific period of time. This mitigates your entire Oh, yeah, fee. I understood that part perfectly. So the part that I tried to explain is why that rate is going to be really high. It is, for example, extremely inequitable if you charge people 80% of their graduating salary in order for universities to cover their financial costs. That was a super punitive amount to charge them. That was going to be really prohibitive in the way they were going to live their lives. That was going to make university way less accessible. We totally understood what you were saying, and we also understood how damaging it was going to be. So how did this make university courses worse? When universities wanted to minimize financial risk for themselves, they had to ensure as much as possible that they got as close to 100% graduate employment so they'd have something to charge from and that those graduate employment salaries were as high as they could possibly could be. What do they suggest this will mean for university action? They say things like strong alumni networks and sort of training for interviews that they don't really explain. We think that those are, first of all, really nebulous ideas. It's difficult to understand why a university would want to take on even more risky operations given the financial climate there about to enter. But secondly, we think there are just things they're far more likely to do because they're easier because they can implement them straight away. That looks like changing the course types to prioritize more employable courses like commerce, like medicine, like engineering, and deprioritizing courses like teaching, like history, like archaeology, giving them fewer places, making them harder to get into because those rates were lower. But within courses, it also looked like prioritizing elements and topics that push for high paying specialties like tax law over human rights law. This was super damaging to students who are now limited in the courses that they could choose to do, that were not given the chance to express themselves in a university degree that they always thought they would be able to, that meant that those industries and sectors within society slowly died out as their employee pool shrunk to a tiny size. This had massive societally ranging effects that were incredibly negative on the ability of people to enjoy their lives. Moving on to my second substantive contribution about how this dangers the accessibility of universities. Note that the entirety of this point will be directly responsive to all the material they gave you about making it easier for people in vulnerable financial situations to go to university. So firstly, I think I already outlined how university fee structures will change to become way more expensive, and that is obviously a huge harm for affordability. But it's also important to notice when this policy occurs. Because when you take a massive amount of someone's income as they are employed on a graduate salary, that's probably the most financially vulnerable time in their entire life. Because if you have a student loan like we propose would be the better way, that is a loan which stays at the same amount while your income grows over your lifetime, unlike a loan, which is a much shorter time scale that occurs at probably a pretty low income point for you. That also meant that this was less affordable when you analyzed it over the course of your lifetime. But additionally, universities are way less accessible because they had no incentive to omit students from a low socioeconomic status. In a status quo, student loans mean, uh, mean that these students can pay back loans because those costs are distributed over time and universities don't have to worry about it because either way, it's a bank responsibility. Also, universities have far greater certainty because those 
fees are being paid ahead of time. In their world, universities want to actively disadvantage, they are actively disadvantaged, sorry, by picking people of low socioeconomic status because it was a greater risk, because they had less likely of being um, employed after graduating, and because they had a higher dropout rate. That meant they were going to actively cut out people from being able to go to university just because of their low socioeconomic status. That was a massive harm for inequality and a huge principal burden that Team India had to defend against once they could reconcile with what this debate actually had to be a comparison between so proud to oppose. Okay, uh, we thank Leader of Opposition for a very fine speech. Now, if judges are ready, we'll be moving on toward Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dick. Um, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Team Australia in this debate is incredibly proud when they say student loans are the better way. I want to start off by characterizing that the United States, a developed country, has over $1.2 trillion worth of student loans. That is a world that cripples some of the people who cannot pay back these loans, that condemns students after university to lives that they would never want to live in the first place. My substantive push in this argument, in the, in the speech, is about why we help the quality of education for the most vulnerable people. But before that, two areas of clash. Firstly, on access. Secondly, on students' choice. Firstly, on access. The big push that we get from their side is that universities don't have funding. I want to flag that their entire case relies on this assumption. And if we're able to disprove this in our speech, we think the vast majority of their case falls. Because when they say that the, we can't have a world in which governments support universities because it's a this house refers motion, I want to give them something that really clarifies this debate. Universities still make a lot of money from the royalties that students pay over a predetermined number of years. All our side's doing is just covering up the upfront costs that a lot of smaller universities have. That we think governments can do, because if their side is relying on governments supporting people on their side of the house, then why can't the government help people on our side of the house when it's presumably cheaper, because universities are already able to take care of a lot of these costs in the first place, which means that we will be able to have universities that have access to this money fundamentally. But their broader point in this debate is that it's much worse to pay royalties to universities over a long period of time than it is to be saddled in loads. I want to be very clear about the two reasons here through weighing why we think it's much better to pay back your university, even if the royalties are slightly higher in our worst case than to pay back loans. The first is that the interest rates of loans increases as time passes. That is, every year that passes by, you need to pay back more and more. The thing about the royalties on our side of the house is that it's not on that basis. That is, if your income decreases, you pay less because it's 2% of that less income. Loans do, not dis loans do not give you that benefit, so we think you're fundamentally worse off. Second, it's much better to owe a university over the long term the, this money than it is to owe something like a bank or like the person who's giving you these loans, because if you um, default on this on their side, what ha fundamentally happens is that your credit rating goes down, which locks you out of uh, uh, the ability to access money in the future. We think it's significantly better to like pay back a university, even in our worst case scenario, if it is slightly more expensive, than to pay back student loans that will never be paid back on their side of the house. So through weighing, we think we're much better at the end of the day. And we don't think universities have no funding on our side of the house. I wanna bring back up our argument here because they said that, uh, you, uh, that universities cut out poor people, more vulnerable people. They don't wanna admit them um, because they are afraid that they won't make that much money after university. But here's a little bit, uh, here's what we brought you in contrast. What we said is that universities are likely to do things like outreach programs, right? Because universities often wanna do things like offer scholarships because they think that there are really talented people from minority communities who can do really well at university and get good jobs. 
Universities don't go to those people to begin with because it's a cost to them, giving them scholarship, making it accessible is a cost. They're not getting anything in return. On our side, they are. So how do you weigh between these two arguments? Why do you think universities are likely to do more outreach? The reason is, on their side, a lot of these people don't even apply to university to begin with because it's not seen as an option for them. On our side, these people at least um, apply to universities to begin with, so the burden is placed on the universities. That is, when lots of minorities, women, are applying to universities, it's harder for a university to deny them admission into their university because they can be called racist. That's the reason why a lot of universities are flagged that way. Because they at least apply, we think the burden is pushed on universities to take in more diverse groups, whereas on their side, they can be like, oh, it's not our problem. They didn't apply to begin with. There's nothing much we can do. Which means, at the end of the day, access is significantly better for some of the most marginalized people, we'd love for their side to respond to that. I want to now talk about the second classroom speech on students' choice, because the big push that they had here is that universities are likely to deprioritize uh, departments like archaeology and uh, like liberal arts because they're not that high paid. Outside of the fact that this is also hung on them proving that universities are substantially underfunded, which was their case, I want to take this a step further and say that these fields on the status quo that they have to support on opposition are dying too. That is to say that archaeology and other fields like liberal arts are dying. And the reason they're dying is because students on their side don't even want to take up these fields to begin with because they're saddled in student loans. Tell me, why do you think so many university students are ending up in finance? Because they have no option. They need to pay back these student loans, so they have to enter into those fields. On our side, they don't have that burden, right? That means it's easier for them to demand their university to offer things like humanities departments because they're not under that pressure to pay back those loans. And we think that the way here is on their side, they're saying universities will not like fund these departments because it's not profitable. We're saying university will fund these departments because students are asking for it. The way to resolve this is that students are asking for this. That is, universities have to fundamentally do this because students are saying, I will want to attend the university where I can choose what I want to study rather than have to be condemned to a horrible, horrible job. We also think universities are more pressured to make a lot of humanities fields more employable by connecting them to fields like consultancy, by doing things like teaching them the transferability of these skills. On their side, these fields are only dominated by the most privileged people. That is, a privileged person wants to study sociology at a university because they don't see themselves um, you know, entering into a really high paying job. On our side, universities try to make these fields more employable, which means that more poor people who want to study African American studies get that on our side. So we're fundamentally better in that regard. Point of which, at the end of the day, we respect students' choice. We are better for this field as Ivan flips on its head. Before I move on to my substantive point, I'll take your POA. If you charge 70% of a student's graduating salary, would that be a lesser amount than what they would have to pay back They're on a student? Not. We don't think the vast majority of universities are going to be charging 70% of, of you know, $100,000, $50,000 income from, from people, right? When your tuition fees are like, when university tuition fees are like generally 50000 we think it's over 10 years, 20 years where they're charging 2%. Tell me what university is doing that in the status quo. Okay, my argument is by why we improve the quality of education. Look, we think we are as debaters are often in the lead bubble where we think that we attend really big universities. A lot of poor people are often attend, often attend poor for profit universities. So universities like Kaplan, Trump University, Arizona, Arizona University. And these universities often target these people because they say, if you come into my university, I'll give you a cheap degree, which allows you to get access to a job. Why do we think these universities are able to fundamentally charge students a lot of money? There are three reasons. The first is that they can be coercive, that they can use things like advertisements and like make people believe that a university education is something they need to get. Secondly, a lot of these people don't have alternative universities to go to, so it's often these only for-profit universities that remain the option. The third reason that they can often do this is because of the fact that they, um, uh, because they can lie to students and say that we've given a lot of people degrees, look at our success rate, which means that what happens is universities can charge lots and lots of money from students through this coercive narrative, which means I want to flag here that any response that they give on like universities can make it cheaper doesn't hold true because they're inherently able to make it expensive on their side. Why is this harmful? Because universities are charging very, very high amounts of money for like just a simple degree that students can get. The problem with that is they don't make these degrees high quality because there's no incentive to do that. That is, I just need a, a computer science degree from St Stephen University that just teaches me um, theory instead of algorithms to be able to land a job in McDonald's. And the problem with just getting a degree like that is that I just don't progress in my field. That means that the degrees don't have that much value. 
The alternative is a world in which universities get money to quality education, which means these degrees are a high value and you don't have to charge that much money to people. We help the most vulnerable, we help improve quality of education. We're incredibly proud to stand on King Proposition. Okay, uh, we thank DPM for her fine speech. Um, it seems both judges are ready to move on. So we'll invite DLO. Thank you so much. Just checking that I'm visible and audible. Yes, you are. Very clear. Awesome. Starting my speech then in three, two, one. Team India walks a fine line in this debate, which is to say on the one hand that the status quo is one where universities charge huge costs, but there's no way they're gonna charge huge interest rates in their world. That in their second speech, they employ incredibly coercive tactics, but there's no way they will offer punitive punishments in the same way banks do. Observe how they run away from what our world actually looks like. Perhaps they know they can't win there, we oppose. Two things I'm gonna do in this speech before substantive. First, I'm gonna prove why our side gets universities to be more accessible. And second, I'm gonna prove why we get a higher quality of education. On the first, I think the biggest thing to note is that the majority of stakeholders under the status quo take out student loans. Let's talk then about why they are preferable to this model. They say they are bad for two reasons. Firstly, that there are interest rates. We reject this. We note that most government-led systems aren't those with interest rates, but even those that are, I'll deal with later. Secondly, they say that they are punitive. Two main responses here. Firstly, I think it's likely that these are not at all exclusive to these student loans. That is because universities are profit incentive. In our first speech, we outlined why universities charge exuberant amounts under our side. If that is true, it must be structurally true that, that what they want to do is not just provide people with educations, but provide people with educations and make huge profit. That is why side proposition can point to a problem uh, under the status quo. What we would tell you though, that even if the status quo isn't good, they make it actively worse. That's for a few reasons. Firstly, because we reject the idea that universities are just good actors. It doesn't make sense to me that they wouldn't do things like punitive punishment, i.e. take capital that these individuals have if they don't like aren't able to fulfill these loans. These are businesses. These are businesses with huge amounts of capital point to universities like Harvard, which have literally billions of dollars of university and stipends. They can do things like punitive punishment. But secondly, note why it actively gets worse under their side. That is all of the mechanisms we give you in live speech about why they are less certain that they're able to get the money because of market volatility, which means they are likely to overcharge because they cannot be certain. But secondly, and this is crucial, even at their very best case, even if student loans are to some extent worse, we would say this is still preferable for the crucial reason that it's easier to conceptualize and easier to understand. That is, when individuals are faced with a specific cost and they know that that's what they're going to pay and they know the mechanisms exist which allow them to pay it, that is preferable to universities coercing individuals with jargon about percentage rates and a time frame. Because let's be clear, Team India has not given a time frame for this policy yet. It means that these individuals are going to be less able to understand how much money they're giving up. That is a moral hazard that you need to weigh, even if you can take India at their best, best case, which probably doesn't exist at all. What does this mean then? It means, firstly, that all of their harms about upfront costs fall down. That's firstly, the students who do pay upfront probably pay like probably pay regardless. It is worse on their side because there isn't clarity, but also it's proportionally probably more because these are individuals who are probably going to have high income jobs for, for like a number of years. This is worse then. But secondly, that those who have to deal with the cost of student loans, uh, rather this policy, is it actively worse because universities overcharge and they cannot conceptualize what that means for them. Secondly, then, on access for women and other excluded groups, they say, firstly, that this allows them to send women to universities, and secondly, that allows them to let them work. I think this is an active mischaracterization what? of what norms about misogyny is. That is to say, and POIs in the chat, please, that the reason women can't access education is specifically because of norms that should say that women deserve to stay in the home, that the role of the woman is one of childbearing and is one of like raising a family. Those are the norms which actively lock out individuals from accessing uh, employment and accessing uh, university in that way. You don't defeat these norms with this policy. But secondly, note the principled harm that exists with this, with this policy for women specifically. That is, there is a wage gap that means that women are more likely to be disproportionately 
affected by a policy which targets their income. If they want to stand by women, they have to lose this debate because of the principal hazard that exists there. Finally, on outreach, they give you a weird mechanism here, which is to say that it doesn't apply under the status quo because the university has no burden to, to like uh, enable these individuals to succeed and, and to access these people. This is a lie. This actively gets worse under their side at the point at which universities know that the people they need to actively get in and the people they need to educate are ones who can be highly employed and get high incomes. That is to say, universities are now given the direct incentive not to allow low socioeconomic people in because they are structurally disadvantaged in a way that high income uh, people from high income families are not. That is all of material and live speech, but why things like nepotism and cronyism means that universities are less able to allow individuals to go into university. What do you know then at the end of this point? You know, firstly, that student loans are better because individuals are a able to conceptualize what it means for them but secondly that the ability for universities to hamstring these individuals through inflating costs because of things like market volatility is way less likely under our side but finally they actively worsen things for women because of the pay gap and the disproportionate effect it has on them and it actively worsens outreach second question then which side gets a higher quality of education they say that universities have incentives now to make individuals as employable as possible if that's a claim they want to stand by they lose this debate Firstly, because of the impacts on courses, they say that the arts are dying because they are low paying, but also that individuals will ask them under our side where the payment they receive is actively worse because of this policy. What that means they have to stand by then is a world in which arts courses just are A, less employable uh, just because of the nature of the status quo, but B, that universities start to take them away because they're not as employable. They do not deal with the structural factors, which means that the arts are like disproportionately affected by things like capitalism, which just means that universities are structurally incentivized to make sure that they don't offer these courses in the same way. Second, on the impacts to behavior and care, what this policy does is, by their own analysis, make these individuals just mechanisms of a machine that they can pull out to make them money. That means that they have the direct incentive to make sure that they're in as many classes as possible, learning as much content as possible, but specifically content that can make money. That's contract law and commercial law, not human rights law. That means that universities are likely to jeopardize things like care and, and pastoral events, things like debating, which is a huge cost that exists because they know that that is time that these students should probably be sent, spent studying. That's a harm. Uh, On to finally, whether or not these degrees are coercive. This was a strange push because they say that uh, things like uh, computer science, and I'll take a POI in a second, uh, are more likely to be uh, impacted on these, like uh, more likely to be coerced into things like computer science. This is a lie for all of the mechanisms we've given you at live in this speech about why universities perceive things like computer science to be highly employable and will likely push individuals into them. Before one point of substantive about how this worsens the experience of universities, I'll take a point. Is it worse to be in debt to student loans that have increasing interest rates or have to pay a fixed one or 2% royalty over 10 or 20 years of time? Uh, I think the fact that you said 10 or 20 years time is probably indicative that your model is far worse, A, because individuals can't understand it, but B, because that POI is completely unresponsive to all of the material we give you at Live about why universities are likely to inflate what that percentage is. That is to say, there is absolutely no reason in, your, in any of your speeches why it would be 1%, why it would be 5%, because universities, by your own analysis, are money making. So obviously, they're going to do things like maximize their profits. Obviously, in that world, these loans are better. One point of substantive then about why this increases the... Uh, betterment of experiences at university, note that some of this material was dealt with in rebuttal. Firstly, the fact that the primary purpose by Team India's own analysis is speed and specialization, that is getting individuals into the workplace and getting them into workplaces which are high paying. That means that they are no long, longer focusing on things like experiences and things like uh, clubs and other activities. That's crucial because what universities do for individuals is help them to self-actualize, help them to work out what they're passionate about, what they want to do. Note how fundamentally important it is for individuals at universities not just to study what they want, but to try different experiences so they know where they can direct their lives once they leave university. Note crucially, like the wealth of evidence that exists vis-a-vis -vis books and studies, which say that individuals who are happy, individuals who care about their courses, individuals who like are able to self-actualize do do better, which means we co-opt all of their analysis about why universities make students better. At the end of this speech, we get universities more accessible, we get a better quality of education, we oppose.
Okay, uh, we thank Diallo for a very fine speech. Now let's move on to government whip to try to summarize the case on the proposition side. Thank you. Yep, give me 15 seconds, please. Hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Very clear. Great. Um, do you guys audibly for me? And putting up my timer. Starting my speech in three, two. I don't know what opposition thinks of universities because they might be profit incentivized, but they aren't stupid. So you know what? Let's take them on their best case. Instead of 1%, they charge 5% of the income, but it's very, very definitely not 70% or 80% of incomes of people because guess what? People will literally starve on the ground. Nobody will actually end up going to the university when they like to all their life will have no money to afford anything in their life, right? That's to be clear. A university, the rational actors will make sure that these income is uh, actually properly divided. Recognizing that, two classes in this speech. Firstly, on the access to education. Secondly, on which side increases quality of education. First class done on access to education. Here, first let's deal with this argument that come, comes from their side of it is just much more risky for colleges and they end up costing significantly more. One, let's be very clear, throughout all of their speeches, they have just chosen to ignore our model, right? And you only charge a percentage of your income. So let's get, for instance, universities end up wanting to charge more. If, for instance, they are charged 2%, 3%, 5% of your income, it still doesn't cost you that much because that means that your income increases as well, for instance. That means this is stuff that these people can afford to pay back. But secondly, on this idea, even if they overcharge, it's just significantly easier to pay back money on our side the house because of two reasons. One, because this is spread out instead of upfront. You can pay it over 10 years, 20 years. It just means it's easier for individuals to pay back. But secondly, and this is to be very crucial, this responds directly to a lot of their analysis that people know better, because let's be clear, the people they claim know better are literally 17, 18 year olds that are heading up from high school to college. On our oh, side, man. is the side that people know better, because now you are a college graduate who understands how the real world works, who has actually worked, for instance, part-time jobs in college has some safety and that means you're much more likely able to make financial decisions for you than the literal 17 year old ever was going to able to be. But let's then compare this to what we told you. And this was a comparative they never really wanted to contend with. Student loans. And let's not pretend that student loans are any good in the status quo, right? All of us know what's happening in the US where literally is people are dying and are not able to pay back their what? student loans at the point which those prices are significantly high. You're doing so well in med school, yet you have no money left over to be able to do the things you want to do because you're still just stuck in debt because of their side of the house. And why is this just much, much worse? First, because of compound interest. And they can't just come up here and tell you interest doesn't exist because guess what panel? That's how loans work. Interest does exist. And that means all of their analysis about, oh, you can't conceptualize how much you have to pay doesn't work because you can't conceptualize how much you have to pay either on their side of the house and actually increases because interest rates are just significantly more volatile than your income. Secondly, it takes away property. It's punitive. But third, when you know that individuals aren't able to pay back, that means you create bad credit scores. And that's when individuals are less likely to, for instance, create businesses, able to have startups because you can't get the loans you need to because you're still suffering because of your student debt. But let's then deal with the second claim that comes from your side of the house. Did you just end up not paying or just uh, hiring minorities? A couple of responses. First, we think we change universities' incentives. You want the most talented person. You want the most meritocratic person because that's the person who can do best in jobs. That's the person in these companies who will do amazing and make sure that gets these companies most profit. And that means the companies have an incentive to hire the person who is the best. And let's be very clear. Anyone can be the best. And that, that, that's why, for instance, if they don't care if you have a rich dad when you're working for a company. They care if you're able to do what they need you to do. That means companies 
hire those that are the most talented the mo and that means that on our side of the house universities also have the incentive to do this but secondly we told you the problem right from the beginning was that minorities self select out of coming to these universities and recognize this is really really crucial because universities do have incentives to have minorities outside of this one because you're getting diverse representation of thoughts into things like research which a lot of universities do focus on but second let's be clear we live in a pretty liberal world there's massive pressure by social movements to make sure that the only people that are there in a university aren't only white people however on their side of the house universities can just actually not face any of that accountability face any of that backlash because they can claim i am not the one at fault it's these individuals who are not applying to their universities they are the ones at fault that means you just significantly worsen health for minorities and lastly on this idea that they claim in their second speech that you just get less money and that hurts cross cultural activities like debating two responses first more people coming in means more money then when you have more people applying to colleges that means just on an average level level you're getting more money coming in but secondly there are always going to be individuals that just become really really successful they just by coincidence become really really rich and for those people a 1% or a 5% percentage of their income is going to give you massive amounts of money that can make up for the loss any other individuals are giving you that means that we do get the bearing better on our side of the house oh, let's talk about what we told you and went unresponded firstly we told you poor just cannot afford loans on their side of the house feel much more comfortable when into going into part time jobs because they can't afford to go to universities but secondly notice you hurt women on their side of the house and there were, there were two responses to this let's deal with this one the women who don't access education either on either side of the house is symmetric this is nuancedly about women who for instance do want to add, uh, access education just don't have the resources to do so because their families won't prioritize it but secondly on this idea that gender wage gap i don't know what you look at but a lot of companies do have I have women. 50% of the population is not just one that goes unemployed. But lastly, we told you, for instance, you get increased outreach that is massive for all of these reasons. We get much more vulnerable people elect, uh, coming in to these universities. Give them an actual chance at life. Before I move on, is there any view on it? As a team, you have not been able to provide a consistent rate or time frame. If you can't conceptualize these factors, how can a uni student or someone of low socioeconomic status? First, we think sure. If you want a consistent amount of time, then we'll give you ten years. Guess what? That's okay. Second, we think universities are able to make rational decisions. If they can choose how much fees to give, we sure they can choose like a number of years. Third, governments can regulate that. Like I don't know where that's going. Second, second flash there on quality of education. Firstly, on this argument that you just don't never talk about humanity on their side of the house. I Three responses to this. First, it makes no sense for universities to do this because if everyone's getting a financial degree, what happens then? Well, guess what? The job market for finance gets oversaturated, and you need people with no jobs because more and more people might coming up into that degree. The number of jobs remains the same. You get more people unemployed. Second, people going into finance when they didn't want to go into it, wanted to actually study, for instance, African American history, aren't going to be doing well in finance. These are the people who are likely stuck in the least paying jobs in finance because they didn't want to do. Finance. They didn't specialize in it. They're probably not good at it. But thirdly, notice these are the people who end up just going to another college that does give them that liberal arts degree. We're unsure why that works. But secondly, notice we think actually colleges do have the incentive to prioritize humanities for the two reasons. One, because these are fields that are becoming much more and more lucrative because of things like racial sensitization being in demand. But second, or again, minorities self-select on out of their side of the house. On our side, these are the people who demand for these sorts of fields because they want to do it, can't afford to do it because they don't have to be worried. About About student debt loans and not being able to pay it. That means that individuals want to do something; they're actually able to do it much better on our side of the house. But lastly, then let's compare this to what we told you. Firstly, on for-profit universities, into which they can't continue forcing these individuals, regardless of whatever they wanted to believe, because their entire income scheme changes. That means they have to teach them more practical stuff. But secondly, we told you you establish alumni networks. You care more about things like interviews. You teach them more practical stuff, like for instance, in medical school, not just teaching them textbooks, but actually giving them proper knowledge on the ground. It means Individuals are just much more likely prepared after the real world, get much better jobs, and do much better in life. So so proud to propose. Okay, we thank Gambang Web for a very fine speech. Uh, we'll be moving on toward opposition Web. Here, here.
Am I audible? Yes, you are. <laughs> the faithful bloke opposition is dealt by their own blade because as much as they want to say that unis are profit motivated that is the exact reason why universities will overcharge and note that it's easier to do that under side proposition because when people ask why the percentage is so high unis can say it's because they don't know how much everyone will earn they can say because it's risky they can say that they can justify that and that's why the price goes up and that's why this opposition eventually loses out on this debate maybe we're not talking about 80 percent, but in fact it is enormously greater because 10 percent over 20 years is two salaries and that's obviously far greater than any sort of cost that happens under our side just because it is a percentage in this debate does not mean it's lesser. Don't let side proposition get away with that. There are two questions I'm going to answer in this speech. First, how does this affect the ability of students to go to university? And second, how does it affect the quality of education at these universities? First, how does this affect the ability of students to go to universities? And this is important because this is what the entire of opposition case is based on. So if we break this down, they cannot win the debate. Their first line of attack is to say that it's more accessible because it's cheaper. There are four problems with this argument. The first thing to note is that student loans can exist under our side. Their response is to say that student loans build up with, with interest. First, in many cases, it is free. In the case, like we're not just talking about the US in this debate, there are other countries in this world. And we would know that education structurally is something that is often politically popular for the reason that many people are students, many people benefit from the education, and everyone is able to receive that benefit. But the second thing to say that is clearly uncomparative to their side, which I'm about to explain, is likely to be substantially worse. So the second problem with their case is that we say that universities can now charge more because universities are naturally more likely to be cautious at the point where they can point to this risk and they say that's why we're charging more and they have the ability to do that by their own analysis under proposition because in many cases there are few universities in specific areas which means that they're able to gouge that price and that it's unlikely to be backlash for the simple reason that universities can say it's because there's more risk but second because they can justify those fees because they can say we don't know what you're going to earn in the future which naturally means that it's unlikely that that this opposition can try and stop those prices from rising, which means that this opposition is actually the one that is forcing people to pay more money. So, but the third thing to say is let's take them at their best case and assume that money necessarily is lesser on their side. We would note that money doesn't matter if universities don't accept many of these low SES students in the first place. And we give you this, we, we give you this from birth, from live, which is to explain that in many cases, they will turn away students because they are, because for the first time, there's actually a chance of them losing money of students, which necessarily means that they're less likely to take on those low SES students. Opposition can't rely on the vague words of social movements and ignore the reality that in many cases, universities are discriminatory. They ignore the fact that in many cases, they're likely to do things like look at your family, see how many of them are employed, look at your past, where you come from, the employability of your neighborhood. And that necessarily means that under opposition, even if in their best case, they can prove that their degrees cost less money, we will explain that universities still turn away the people that opposition says that they will help. And that also notably explains why their responses about speculative outreach are unlikely to come. Because it's unlikely that universities go into neighborhoods with the hope that they will come out with someone who is able to go to that university, rather than just putting money into students who are rich, students who have connections, students who they think are going to be most employable, which means that even in this opposition's best case, where they perhaps prove that to some extent their degrees are cheaper, that is not a reason why the people they want to access these degrees will get it. But the final problem with this argument is that for the stakeholders opposition talked about, other factors exist other than money. For example, time, for the reason that you might need to do things like work at a family business, you might need to work right now, which means that you cannot do things like go to university, even if this opposition proves that the price is lower. So at the end of that, what do we know so far? It's only under our side where those degrees are cheaper. Even if this opposition can prove to some extent that their degrees are cheaper, we have explained that those people who they want to benefit are likely to be rejected by these universities before they even get to the front door, meaning that even in their best case, we win. The second thing to talk about then here that they claim is about misogyny, which they say will stop in education and fathers will send their daughters to university. The reason why misogyny existed weren't because of uni fees. It was because they believed that women shouldn't work and should stay in the household. It was because they believed that they couldn't work in business and be successful. It's unclear why those norms change under proposition, and they haven't explained that logical link at the end of that. So what we know so far is that clearly under our side, it is more accessible, not only because it's cheaper, because the universities don't have incentives to reject students before they get into the front door. So the second question I'm going to talk about in this speech is how does it affect the quality of university education? But before that, I'll take a point if you've got one.
for a poor dad who wants to send his children to college but can afford to do so for only one why would they for instance pay 6 lakhs to send their uh, daughter to college when they can just send their son so i have firstly explained that if you're if if you're someone who's not misogynistic that probably happens under both sides but the second thing i've explained is that the cost on your side is actually far greater but the third thing i've also explained is that even if you prove that the cost is lesser many of these people you guys want to talk about are likely to be rejected by these universities because these universities believe that they're not employable because they don't have connection because perhaps their parents are unemployed because of other social factors that exist that are incredibly discriminatory the only response this opposition says is social movements it's unclear how that translates into reality we know for a fact that discrimination exist and this opposition must confront it so how does this affect the quality of university education and notice that this is crucial because this affects literally every student in university and therefore this is a benefit that multiplies to an enormous scale it means that students who want to so who want to study philosophy or the arts can no longer do that under opposition it means that law students are forced to things like corporate law rather than humanitarian law that they have a passion for there are two points under this the first thing i'm going to look at is courses which will completely disappear and second i'm going to talk about all other courses getting worse Firstly, on courses that completely disappear, and this is an immediate harm that this opposition must confront. The only response is to say that these courses are dying anyway, to which I would note that this is mitigation at best that does not actually respond to the argument and is uncomparative to the extent that we still have these courses as we uh, as we do under the status quo, whereas this opposition doesn't at all. The second line of attack is that they say that rich courses will become oversaturated. which we would explain that there are all the other courses which exist other than finance like law which these people are likely to be funneled towards rather than the actual passions that they have that are now denied because these people cannot access them because there is no money to go around and these courses are crushed the second thing that i'm going to talk about then here is all courses getting worse and this is because there is less likely to be broad focus in your degree which necessarily means that you cut out many other important parts of university as we explained at the first and second minimal response we explained firstly that there are social benefits of fits of being at university that this university can no longer afford we explained secondly that you perhaps lose broader conceptions of learning and only focus specifically on employability even though that's something that's not beneficial let's deal with their claims here firstly they say that universities will make their students most employable The first thing to say is that we think that opposition has a narrow conception of what's good for students. Cuz we would say that if you have less critical thinking skills because you only focus on that degree, that is something that's actually bad. The average person changes jobs many many times in their life, and that is something that means that opposition cannot rely on narrow thinking skills in order to keep these people employable. But the same thing to note is that you don't get to grow socially in an incredibly important part of your life. When you're 18 or 19 or 20, under a proposition, you have no capacity to do social activities because universities don't offer that. Because they can't say that we have enough money to actually fund this because they don't know the salaries of their students once they finish their jobs. The final line of attack in this debate is that they say that they universities care about you in the long term. That is unlikely because a trade-off exists, which is to say that universities would not prioritize speculative long-term benefits over direct benefits of funneling money to students right now in the short term which guarantees them money. So, at the end of this speech, what do you know? Our side is actually the one that makes university degrees cheaper. But even if you don't buy that and you believe that opposition is the one that is university degrees cheaper, we've explained that our degrees are not only better, but they are also likely to be accepted by the people that opposition wants to help. So proud to propose. Okay, uh we thank Opwe for very fine speech. Now let's moving on to op reply. Yeah, uh since there's no POI so there's no indication of women but only 3 and 4. Thank you so much. Perfect. Can I get some indication that I'm audible? Yes, you are. Um, starting my reply in 3 2 1. Two issues in this debate. The first on who made university more accessible particularly for people of lower socioeconomic status and the second on the quality of university both for the students and the broader society that ended up accepting those graduates. So firstly on the matter of accessibility Team India opened their case by telling you that this would lower the cost of universities meaning there would be greater access and that that would lead to things like greater equality for particularly protected groups as well as social mobility. But they 
failed to then sufficiently respond to our analysis about the fact that universities have to estimate risk, meaning that the higher they had to charge a higher amount of money in total in any given year, because they had to estimate things like inflation rises and interest rises, that they were likely to overestimate those things because of the high risk that had greater consequences than underestimating, and because they had fixed commitment costs that they simply had to meet. That meant that they were always going to have to charge a greater amount, and that even if they didn't have to, they were always going to anyway, meaning that the vast majority of people in propositions world were charged more. Their main response to this, which was that this is not as bad as student loans, which have interest rates and punitive consequences should these not be paid. We responded to this entirely at second when we told you that because universities and businesses, they operate on the exact same set of incentives as banks do, and that they were just as likely to have policies like interest rates, to have policies like punitive damages when you were not able or refused to pay back this amount of money. So that was obviously a symmetrical harm that they tried to take down this argument with. So at the end of that, student loans not only charged less money in total, meaning that they charged each individual student less on a one-to-one -one basis, but they also had far less risk involved, meaning that the interest rates they could charge were lower and the repayments they could charge were lower, meaning that overall we were the side that brought you more accessible university. A distinct and separate way we brought you more accessible university was the fact that because universities will not want to risk having to give someone a degree for free under a proposition's policy, that they will block individuals who have a low socioeconomic status out of admissions and that will exacerbate the poverty cycle. India's only response to this was that universities will understand that the world should be meritocratic and pick the best person to achieve the highest salary. And in this, managed to ignore almost every structural reason in society that this would simply realistically not be the case. We outlined this succinctly at third, when we told you that these individuals don't have the networks from their school and from their parents. They have higher dropout rates because of the multiple obligations that they have in their lives. And that universities have access to statistics like what neighborhoods people live in and what kind of parental income they have that mean they are likely to make decisions on this discriminatory basis. But even if India is correct, and they will actually be willing to take in some of those people, we think we explained to you down the bench why they were going to overcommit themselves to pay this money when an absolute loan always meant their financial situation would be better because it was a clearer amount. At the end of that, no matter which path you took to get there, we were the side that gave you more accessible university. Lastly, on the secondary issue of the quality of education. They tell you that when universities have an incentive to teach degrees to get graduates employed, they will make their degrees more employable and this will be better. They also, you, like this same incentive analysis is used by us to prove that now universities only offer employable course types and within those courses only offer very narrow subsets of what that education can be. And we explain why that's so damaging to individuals' mental health, to increasing dropout rates, to professions dying out within society and creating worse learning overall. Their response to this is that universities will instead make courses employable. We tell you that universities will likely take the easiest road out and that looks far more like cutting out programs and adding new ones. They also tell you that market saturation will fix the specific industry problem. But as we tell you down the bench, even if that pressure exists and changes the, what kind of industry it is focusing on, the pressure nevertheless exists for graduates to do something which they are not interested in, which they are not necessarily skilled at. That was incredibly damaging for their mental health and it was harmful to society's productivity when individuals weren't going into careers that they were good at or interested in. At the end of that, they also lost any aspect of the student experience when universities only had an incentive to focus on graduate employment and salary. At the end of that, we think that our education was one that helped students' mental health and helped society, but if not for that, it was one that all people in the world could access, and that was practically and principally why we won this debate. Okay, uh, we thank opposition reply for a fine speech. Now let's invite last speaker, government reply, to close the entire debate. Here, here. Hi, just checking that I'm both audible and visible again. Yes. Perfect. Speaker, all of opposition's case in this debate is contingent on universities having no funding. Their argument on not taking minorities, their argument on cutting departments, and a majority of their case depend on this. However, there are very simple responses to that that we've been running since first that they just don't seem to want to respond to. 
first. We just need 15 to 20 kids from this class to do really, really well, because that is massive amounts of money that you get in the form of royalty. Money you can use to cross subsidize for poor students, and it's far greater than money that you'll make off of just random tuition fees. We think that we push this down to you down the line, and it is appalling that this is unresponded to even after we bring it up at first, second, and third. But we think that at the point at which that is true, a bulk of their case is just untrue. But second, what is more likely? Governments not stepping in when universities charge 70% royalties, which is quite frankly appalling, wild, and exploitative, or them using all the money that goes towards scholarships, that goes towards subsidies right now, and using them to give universities cushions and security loans. This is the model that we've been running since first. It is just appalling that they don't adapt to it. Bearing that in mind, two questions. First, on which side makes universities more accessible? Second, on which side allows the students gain more out of university? On the first question, our side uniquely gives the most vulnerable students a foot in the door. The reason this is true is because you don't have to deal with the upfront costs. And contrary to what they tell you, and as Hitesha says, the reason women aren't being sent to university right now isn't because of sexist norms telling them to stay home at work. Rather, it is sexist norms believing that their son can probably do more with that degree. At the point at which there's no bar to getting that degree, that's the point at which you can also benefit off of your daughter going to uni. That's when you send women to school. That's when we are far better for a very vulnerable stakeholder, as Hitesha explains. But crucially, at the point at which vulnerable people get their foot in the door, all of the benefits second opposition preaches can only exist on our side of the house. Any shot of social mobility, as we've told you down the case, can only exist on our side because more people are going to university. This will way past literally anything that they tell you in this round. Because even in our absolute worst case, if sure, you teach more computer science than you do philosophy at the point at which people still get university degrees. At the point at which people still have a shot at social mobility, we still take it over their very, very marginal harms. Second, let's just take a second to compare student loans with royalty. What is a royalty? If my income goes down, I still pay my 2% and I am not punished. On a student loan, if my income ever drops, because as we all know, labor markets are very, very competitive, I have my single mother's home seized if I default. My bank won't lend to me ever again because they view me as untrustworthy. We think that that is punitive, toxic, and deeply harmful to the most vulnerable individuals in this society. On the second question then, I think that winning that one art clash in and of itself gives us a massive independent path to victory and puts us above Australia. But I'm just gonna win on both fronts for the fun of it. Second, on universities being better. First, contrary to what they say on only rich white people being taken up, we think that the point at which you look at your demographics and there's only like top one, two percent white people, that's when you are regulated. That's when you are critiqued. This is what Karthik tells you in a second that goes drastically unresponded to on their side of the house. But if anything, why are we far better? First, as I told you in my first speech, you are more likely to go into poor communities to find diamonds in the rough, people who are brown or black, who you can crucially do things like train and profit off of. On the comparative, the problem is that you never go into these communities in the first place because we can't pay your high fees. We think that on our side of the house, we give the most vulnerable communities a foot in the door by crucially ensuring that outreach exists. At the end of this round, we've taken the two most important clashes. We've proven to you why the premise of their case doesn't stand and take it over Australia in this debate. Vote Gov. Thank you all debaters for a highly competitive round and high quality as well. Congratulations on both sides. So in the meantime, uh, please cross virtual room, have handshakes, and even if we cannot meet each other in person. Thank, Thank you so, so much, Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. India. Thanks, it's so nice great to see job. you again. Yeah, it's great Thank seeing you guys again too. Uh, do you guys